Hello, my friends. This is The Art of Prepping. Hope you guys are doing well today. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting to chat for a moment about isolation and mental health. You know, there's a lot of people who are isolating from the public for health reasons. At least that's what they think they're doing. And then there's other people who are in isolation because it's been forced upon them. Because other people think it's the best thing for them. So you have this really interesting dynamic that's unfolded around the world. And in some places more so than others, of course. So how do you strike a a mental health balance with all this going on? When there's this... uh, this threat out there. I mean, if you want to call it a, a pandemic, then you can call it a pandemic. If you want to call it a, a series of viruses, you can call it that. If you want to call it a whatever, you know. Uh, but whatever it is that is giving you concern and causing isolation, either you know, either on the side that you choose it or someone else chooses it for you, it can be a problem because there's a lot of various elements, dynamics, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that come together to create results in our mental well-being. And some people just have a much more difficult time than others dealing with this. And we'll get into a lot more detail in a moment, but I just thought maybe I could just kind of talk about this and maybe reframe it for some people Regardless if it's being forced upon you or if it's your choice to isolate, there's different ways to kind of think about isolation so that it's not some super negative thing. Uh, There are many people throughout history, and, and there's people right now, that choose to live in solitude. And that's the first thing I want you to start to think about is, is willful solitude. And solitude can be extremely beneficial for mental health. Solitude actually is kind of almost essential for most people at at different points in your life. But some people need it on a regular basis or they don't function very well. Um, I, for one, really enjoy solitude. And so during this whole period of time that we have, you know, all this has been going on, uh, if you want to call it, a, once again, a pandemic or whatever, um, I've had kind of a transition period like most people, but I, I'm, I've been doing actually pretty well with not being around a bunch of people because I wasn't around a bunch of people to begin with. <laughs> so there wasn't that much of a transition. But I look at all this as willful isolation or solitude. I think it's a better way to say it, solitude. So if you frame this, this whole concept as something that can be healthy, I think that you're going to get a little bit further in in finding your balance. Now, I mean, I know for some people it's like, hey, man, you can call it whatever you want. If I'm not around people, I'm just going crazy and all that. I, I get that, you know, and once again, we'll, we'll get into that in a more, more detail in a moment, but I think we need to set a few things up first. And so there's a lot of people, in fact, I think the bulk of people, they don't really have a real schedule. And I'm not talking about a rigid schedule, but just having some constants in their day, in their week, and in their month, it's kind of a big deal for most people. In fact, I think pretty much everyone really kind of needs some level of it. Some people more so than others, but having a schedule gives you kind of like a known variable so that you can just have one less unknown. And a lot of the unknown variables in life are what gives us a lot of stress. So this kind of goes back to people are different though than each other. Some people deal with stress really well though. Some people thrive on the unknowns of life. But I'd say that more so than not, people do kind of avoid the unknowns because of the potential 
for problems, you know, for all kinds of problems, physical injury, mental injury, all kinds of financial injury, all kinds of things. So we have schedules and it's up to you to kind of figure out what that means to you. Because some people, they do need a lot more, you know, structure than others. Some people, they not so much. Maybe just having one or two things a day that you do on a regular basis is, is more than enough for some people. And so, like for me, I have a certain time that I, I like to go for a walk. I have a certain time that I like to check my, you know, uh, you know, email or I like to check the weather or there are certain times I like to eat, you know, I mean, you know, it's just stuff like that. It can be very simple. Okay. So another thing to kind of think about is exercise. Exercise can really burn off some stress hormones and really kind of help you keep your blood sugar more consistent, which will help with your mood you know, your mood swings will be less. You have less variables, you know, if you keep, you know, your exercise up. And diet, obviously, is another one. Huge. You could argue that the diet is actually more important than the exercise, for sure. I would say that for sure. But let's just go ahead and assume that you're eating pretty healthy. Uh, then exercise is something that you need to take a look at. And I would certainly try to get your heart rate up every day or at least every other day. And I think they, they talk about like just on average, if you can do it for 20 to 30 minutes, like at least every other day is, is a really good, is a really good way to go. And um, you'll see, you know, tremendous improvements on being calm. You just feel more settled. Sometimes you just kind of have to burn off stuff in the body that builds, especially these, these stress hormones. And, um, and also you have to kind of activate other parts of the body. And sometimes you really aren't able to do that unless you get into a more physical mode and activate those, those body uh, mechanisms. And there's all kinds of really awesome uh, neurotransmitters too that are released during exercise. So that you'll, you'll just feel better overall. It's just a, it's just a well-being state that you come into. And so outside of exercise and diet, what are other means of stress reduction? Maybe it's taking like a walk or just sitting out in, in some areas uh, that, are, that are green, you know, like a forest area or a backyard that maybe you have bird feeders and you like to watch that. Maybe it's a type of meditation. Maybe it's you like to listen to music or something. You probably know what you could probably put it together a, at least a, a small list right now of the things that you like to do or be around and so you just try to do more of that you know do more meaningful things do more interesting things do more challenging things because this is the one that gets left out you know it's like okay let's do something that's fun and you do it and you're like, that, that was good, but, you know, I'm kind of just feeling like it could have been better or, you know, I'm missing something in my day. Well, a lot of times that's just that you're not challenged enough. You're not really caught up in deep enough thought. You're not really physically challenged. You're not like really having to push yourself so that you can grow. And for a lot of us, we're not growing very well, you know, like in, in, in our capacities. We're not learning something every day sometimes. We're, we're not really challenged. And this is because life is so easy for a lot of us. We don't really have to be challenged. And a lot of times it's like, ah, you know, it's just on the, the face of things, it's easier not to push yourself. And so you don't. And then you find yourself really stagnant. And then you get depressed. And then you're like, oh, I don't have anything going on. I'm so boring. I'm, you know, and then it just cascades downward. So you don't need to do all that. You can find something challenging. And I'm not saying just like a, a crossword puzzle or a word puzzle or I'm not saying even that. I mean, it could be that maybe to some degree, but I'm talking about like trying to really figure something out that's meaningful to you. Or doing something that you're really proud of doing, right? And it could be like on the health side of things. For example, like maybe 
you build up so that you can jog five miles every morning or every other morning or something like maybe it's uh, weightlifting. There's a goal that you want to be able to lift 400 pounds or something. Uh, maybe it's something totally different, though, than exercise or health. Maybe it's more like you want to write your first book or that you want to paint a picture, you know, and be proud of it. You know, so like there are things that you can work towards. Do different things. So this is something that a lot of us, you know, don't do. We get stuck in ruts. We get stuck in cycles. We get into these habits. I think that habitual actions are probably one of the most frustrating and and difficult things to move through. Habits are so powerful and they put us a lot of times in autopilot in this autopilot mode. And we're not even aware a lot of times how we think and do because we're in a habitual mode. And so it's hard to even be aware of these things because we're just automatically doing it because it's a habit. But you got to be very intentional though in life. You have to stop all through the day purposefully and say, okay, just because this is the standard, this is the norm, this is what I normally do. It doesn't mean that I have to do it today. And you can expand your thinking and doing. And you can do something different. Different is sometimes very good. Doing things differently can sometimes make your life a lot more efficient. Sometimes you'll gain a lot more insight. Sometimes you'll be able to connect with more people in a deeper way because you're trying something different and it actually works better. Maybe you just click with things better. Try different things as you go through your week. Even if it's just one new thing a day, and it might be as simple as instead of going to the same websites every day to check the news or check the weather or to, to check your favorite hobby. You know, there's websites for hobbies all over the place. I do it myself. I have like about seven websites I go to almost every day to check those hobbies just to see if there's anything new that came out. And you know what, though? What I've been doing every day for a long time now is that I just randomly think about something. Well, as much as I can, I'm sure it comes from an unconscious thought or some kind of motivation or something, but I allow some things to surface from the unconscious and I just pick one or two of those things and I look them up and I try to learn about something totally new and different. Sometimes it's just crazy stuff. Like I I tell you what happened yesterday. I was just thinking about airplanes and I, I just started to look up videos trying to learn up about, you know, commercial airplanes. And I found it to be very interesting. I was like captivated for hours learning about the different parts of large commercial airplanes. Like I had no clue that it was that complicated. I mean, it makes sense that there's a lot of complications because I mean, these things are, some of them are, be, you know, behemoths. I mean, these things are gigantic. And I just, I was really mainly paying attention to the Boeing 747 planes. They're just so amazing. I understand why people are obsessed with them, but wow, what a feat of engineering. So that was something that really expanded my mind. I got thinking about all kinds of other things after I watched a few videos of people doing these like professional tours through these planes. Develop a hobby and to further your skills. This is the next thing that Believe it or not, I know that probably most of you guys watching have hobbies and skills that you work on, but there are people that I've met in my life, not very many, but there are some that that, they tell me that they just don't have a lot of interest in anything. They don't, they're not really good at anything or they don't have a hobby. They don't have any skills. And I'm just like, seriously, I mean, it's, it sounds really more like someone's depressed when they say things like that. But sometimes these people are just saying what they believe. And so if you believe you don't have any interest and if you believe you don't have any skills then you, you you girl, I'll probably convince yourself that you don't have any. And in real life, you do have interest. Everybody does. I mean, good Lord. Some of it might be very subtle, but to me, this is what it says. 
that you haven't really explored life very much. If there's not that many things that really, that don't captivate you. Like for me, I'm almost always like overwhelmed with stuff to do, you know, and to look up and to learn. I have so many hobbies that it's just ridiculous. I just want to know about all kinds of things all the time. And so it's, um, for me, life is so freaking interesting and, and it can be a little overwhelming because there's so much to be interested in. But certainly though, even if you have a hobby, you might want to look at just having another little hobby on the side, just so you can bounce around between hobbies. So once you've been into a hobby for a while, you can take a break and go to the other hobby. But for those few people out there that have no hobbies, just take a look. I mean, there's websites that actually outline hundreds and hundreds of hobbies to consider. And I mean, all I'm saying is just try one of them out, you know, that you think that you might have some level of interest to, to explore. And in terms of skills, I mean, there are so many skills, everything from various skills of how to go camping to how to improve uh, you know, the delivery of a speech or how to communicate more efficiently. There are so many practical skills out there. It's so ridiculous for people to say, oh, I'm bored and there's nothing to do and I don't need to learn any skills. We can always learn something new. So, okay. Staying in the moment, being in the moment and avoiding the drift that a lot of us do into the past and sometimes in the future, but a lot of us are more past oriented. We get stuck on things. Sometimes it's trauma. Sometimes it's just like we don't understand something on a, on a deeper level and we get kind of fixated on that. And we kind of try to revisit that in our minds to kind of like figure it out. And, you know, it's almost like you're, you're a detective trying to figure out what happened in your own life. And, you just have to know that there's a perspective that you have, and it may not even be the reality of things. Sometimes we perceive things that happen, but it's not always how it really happened. And I know that kind of drives us crazy. I know it does to me, but it's not to say that you shouldn't trust yourself and you shouldn't believe yourself, but just know that there's different viewpoints for different things. And during a situation that may unfold, your mindset might be somewhere so different than a neutral point of, of reference that maybe you have that internal bias just because of your state of mind at the moment that something happened. So things are distorted. This, this does happen. But even if your mindset was in a neutral position and you were, you know, being as, as much as possible, uh, open to what it is that happened. And, you know, you're trying not to create any other problems or distort what happened. You still have various elements in the way you think that will determine what happened. So it, it's an interesting, you know, thing that we as humans have to deal with our minds because our minds can be a little deceptive. But once again, it's not that you should not trust yourself and not believe yourself, but just understand that sometimes our understanding of what we think happened may not always be as clear as we think it, you know, it was. But staying in the moment is staying out of the past and staying out of the future and, and being present minded so that you can become much more aware, much more conscious of the things going on around you so that you can really engage with the now. You can engage with your environment and you can get a lot more meaning out of your day-to-day -day life. Moment to moment, you get a lot more out of it. If you're focused and you have the intention, you know, to be here as, as you know, the moment unfolds and to be like a witness to the moment that just unfolded, that you to be part of the now. A lot of people are not in the now. They they kind of touch base with it throughout the day. Like they'll pop in and out of the now just for a few seconds only to retreat to the future or the past. You know, they're just kind of stuck in their own minds 
or they're stuck into something else or they'll allow other people to kind of uh, tell them what to do and how to think and things. And so I would say this. You have to practice. And meditating, you know, like meditation or just being in a quiet space. I, I found that to start, it's easier to be in like in a dark, quiet space and just be aware of the darkness, be aware of the quiet. Just focus on your body and, and start to become aware of your breathing and everything like that. You know, whatever is making contact with your body, if you're sitting in a chair, just just kind of pay attention to like the pressure that is there between the chair and the body. Like you just become aware of that and then slowly introduce more and more stimuli. For example, then maybe you go outside and then you sit down and you just pay attention to everything that you can hear. All the birds, maybe there's other animals, maybe there's a car that goes by. Maybe there's an airplane that goes by. Maybe there's wind. Maybe there's like a bunch of sunlight, you know. Maybe it's in the middle of the night. Maybe you pay attention to the stars. Maybe you pay attention to, you know, whatever else is around you. And over time, you start to come into becoming a a bit more of a habit to be more aware. And this is where being habitual can actually be a benefit to you, is that you can get into some really good habits And then you can go on autopilot almost like with expanding your awareness on a day-to-day basis in the moment. Now, that's really where we're kind of moving toward. That's kind of a goal for a lot of people is to really be in the moment and for that to be more like a default. And there are some people who have mastered that. But I would say that the majority of the population, the world is not there. A lot of people are stuck in their heads and they're past oriented. Okay. Do things that you can look forward to. Now, I wrote this one down and I've been brainstorming about this video for, you know, a couple of days now. And I, I got thinking about this. Do things that you can look forward to because it's exciting, because it's motivating, because it's something that can expand yourself into various different directions. And then you become kind of like someone that can explore new things. There's so many like various like tentacles that come off of doing things that are fun. And a lot of times you would uh, typically not even have explored something if it wasn't for something else that came before it. Like, for example, there's times that you meet people and if it wasn't for those people, you would have never known about X, Y and Z. Now, since we're talking about isolation and trying to reframe it in those situations where you may not have much other option as more like solitude. So we're looking at this more of a solitude thing. When it comes to doing things that, you know, are fun to do that you can look forward to, that's going to be a really awesome thing. Now, you may not be able to really do a bunch of stuff with people, but there are things and there's technology that can help us connect with other people. So it is true though, that a lot of people are trying to physically isolate, but there's workarounds. They're not as good though, typically as being with people in person, of course, but there's all kinds of technology to to reach out and to communicate with other people. And you don't need me to tell you about some of those. I mean, this here that what I'm doing right now on social media on YouTube is one example, of course. But we have all kinds of other examples. Foster creativity. Now, this is a great outlet to help also burn off some stress to help your body find a balance. You know, a lot of communicating with people is sharing ideas and expression, right? So connecting with others has a lot to do with expression. And expression can also be done through the creative arts. And even on a hobby level, you don't need to be like a a professional artist to express. I mean, just being a human being is enough. 
So what are some things? What are some just some just general just things that you can do to foster your creativity? Well, you can read a book. You can read a book and it's amazing the new thoughts that you'll have about things or the, it'll just get you thinking about things in different ways. It'll expand your ideology. To write a book, now that's something that I, I think is really good. It's a challenge for most people, for sure. But going back to what we talked about before, sometimes you need challenging things in your day. So that you feel like, wow, I had a very full day. I, I'm satisfied, you know, that you just feel like you've had something of substance that you did. You can draw, you can paint, you can sculpt. Uh, I mean, if you're into music, that's another thing. I, I've tried to be into, into music. I've tried some of this and it just wasn't wasn't the, the thing for me. I'm more into visual arts and, and not so much into making music, but uh, there are certainly a lot of people that are very good that have kind of more of the, I guess, the innate abilities. It's more natural for them to make music. And so definitely do that. Record yourself and share the music with people. That can be very fulfilling, especially when people really do enjoy it. I mean, that's something that right there that is kind of a blessing and a gift. When it comes to the complexity of life, and life certainly is complex. I think that a lot of people overthink things to a degree that they create problems that really aren't there. And, and this is kind of a, a difficult thing to even sometimes describe because it's so common and we fall in the trap so often, a lot, at least a lot of us do, that we're not even sometimes sure of how like to even catch ourselves going down into this spiral. And so we have this history, right, of doing things that aren't so productive and great for ourselves. So how can we prevent that history from expanding? How can we kind of mitigate some of the suffering that we put upon ourselves? And suffering is a really good word for that because most suffering is anguish. And it's, it's put upon by ourselves. We, we choose to anguish about things. And a lot of this is not necessary. So it, it comes down to making the choice of not wanting to anguish. And that's a new concept for a lot of people. Some people think that, oh, if, so, if certain things happen, I have to just get distraught and have to fall apart and be helpless for a period of time. Because that's the norm. But it's really not the case. And I'm not saying, oh, you should be without emotion and cold and all that. No, but there is a point that you can frame things so that it's a lot more logical and it keeps you intact enough so that you're still functional. So you're much more happy when you have meaning in your life. You're much more apt to have victories when you have challenge that's introduced into your day. Do something that's, you know, do something that's challenging and it, that is meaningful and worthwhile. But now we need to talk about the elephant in the room. And, and the, I'm going to close with this, but I want to talk about it for a moment. And that is personality. Your personality for some people in particular, it's huge. It's a huge factor on how you deal and cope. Some people have certain needs, social needs, you know, to be around people, to help people, serve people, all kinds of certain personalities out there really struggle with isolation or even solitude. It's just not in their cards. They're just not really built that well to deal with it. I do feel very 
much for those people. I can only imagine, you know, being stuck somewhere in isolation when it's your natural drive to be with other people. Like it is probably very difficult. And those are the people who are having probably the most mental health issues right now around the world. For those people, I have just a few things to comment, even though I am not of that personality. So I don't know firsthand what it's like to have to have that constant yearning and and need to be around people. But what I can say is look at some of the things that we just talked about. Having some kind of schedule, having some type of structure in your day to help you get through your day and to use technology to connect with people as much as possible. But even more so than that, build up your sense of self and your self-worth because that's going to help carry you a lot further than being dependent on others. Because there are certain personalities that are very social and they sometimes tend to be reliant on others, you know, to, for them to kind of feel like they are themselves, like their self-worth and their self respect. There's a lot of self-esteem issues tied up sometimes in other people instead of having your own sense of self. It's a tricky thing for some people to kind of figure out and differentiate between what it is that they should feel about themselves and the weight that is given on certain topics and ideas given from other people. Some people are so lost in other people's judgment and their own perception that they don't see their own worth. They don't have an individuality complex. Like they don't, they don't see things as an individual, but they only see it through other people's eyes. That's kind of dangerous, if not very dangerous. So this is a great opportunity is what I would say to build your sense of self. If you have a personality that defaults on basically observation and influence from others, this is an opportunity to, to an opportunity to expand yourself and to better understand yourself. It won't be easy, but maybe this is something that you really need to do. And for most people it is, right? But just because it's not easy doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. So these are some thoughts that I've been having about this topic, isolation and mental health. Hopefully this was somewhat interesting and helpful. If you have any thoughts about this topic, please leave it in the comment section. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. Uh, If you like the content, give me a thumbs up and share the video here and my other videos. Feel free to check out my other videos. I really do appreciate that. So once again, thanks for swinging by and and checking out the video. You guys take care. We'll catch you later.